once again, I would love for you to help me welcome warmly a Life on Fire welcome to the stage, the amazing Deanne Goodman. Have you ever experienced a coincidence in your life that turned out to be so much more than a random event? I had a string of coincidences happen in my life that ended up being God and the universe giving me a wake-up call. It started in my 20s when I was an ambitious TV news reporter. By the age of 23, I was a main anchor at a station in Oregon. I moved there knowing no one and I showed up to a newsroom full of catty mean girls who all wanted the job that I had, and they made me hate coming to work every day. A couple months into this job, I had a week-long vacation planned, and this was a really tough time in my life. On this vacation, an email came through my work email, and it was from a woman who said her mom hadn't seen me all week on the news, and she just wanted to make sure I was okay, that I hadn't left the station, and she said that her mom said that I was her favorite news reporter. I wrote back and I said, I'm alive, I'm fine, I'm just on vacation, and thank you so much for your kind words. What I didn't say is that email gave me the validation I needed to want to come back to work. Finally, someone in this town cared. A few months go by and those mean girls leave the station. Bye, Felicia. <laughs> and life got a lot better in Oregon right after that. I set my sights about a year later on getting hired here in my hometown of San Diego. I met with all the news directors, <laughs> and they all told me the same thing. Your reel is good, but we need to see harder news. In the news industry, there's a saying, if it bleeds, it leads. And they wanted more blood on my reel. So I went back to Oregon determined to do as much hard news as possible. But there's one problem. The tiny town of Ben that I was reporting in didn't have that much breaking news and hard-hitting crime stories every day. So this meant that I came into work every day hoping and praying that something bad would happen so that I could cover it. I even told the morning producer, call me if there is ever breaking news or hard news and I will get out of bed and cover it before my regular shift. One snowy morning, she called me and she said, Deanne, there's been a really bad accident about 45 minutes away. Are you able to cover it? And I'm warm in my bed. I'm also really tired. <laughs> and I said, are they dead? And she said, I don't know. The police won't tell me. All I know is it's a really bad accident. And I didn't want to get out of my bed if they weren't dead. <laughs> but I decided, OK, I'll just go. <laughs> so I get to the scene. And I get there as the ambulance is pulling away. I do the story. And I ended up later that day going out to lunch with a friend of mine who was a cop. And the cop told me that the woman in the wreck ended up dying. And my reaction was, sweet, it's a fatal. I went back to the newsroom and I told everyone, you guys, that accident I covered this morning, it's a fatal. And I was given high fives, great job, Deanne, way to hustle. You are now the top story of the evening. I was celebrated. A couple months go by and I ended up doing a story near where that accident was. And I get out to the scene of this other story, and I realized I forgot a tape for my camera. That meant I had to drive all the way back to the station, 45 minutes, back out. And as I'm driving, I'm noticing all these roadside memorials. And I start thinking, I bet I've covered so many of these deaths, and why is this highway so dangerous? Why haven't they done anything about this? So I go back to the station, and I decide I'm going to do a story on this dangerous highway. I get out all the scripts of all the fatal accidents, and I start cold calling people, and I'm asking them if they're related to the deceased. And everyone is hanging up on me, because that is a really awkward phone call to make. <laughs> well, finally, one old man answers, and he says, I don't want to speak to you, but I will put my daughter on. So he gives the phone to his daughter, and I say, hi, this is Deanne with KTVZ. Any chance does your mom have a roadside memorial? And the daughter stops me, and she says, Deanne from KTVZ, my mom was your biggest fan. And I look at the script, and there is the name, Alethea Jackson. And it all connected. 
This was the family that had emailed me when I so badly need someone to validate me. It was Alethea who was in that ambulance and taken off that day of the snowy wreck that I begrudgingly got out of my bed and said I would only go if someone was dead. I was there as Alethea was dying. And it is my biggest fan who I celebrated dying by saying, sweet, it's a fatal. Alethea knew the importance of celebrating people. She knew the importance of telling people you appreciate them. And Alethea completely changed my life. She made me realize that newsrooms could be really toxic environments. And she made me realize that I had become desensitized to death. And that was not the person that I wanted to be. So I left TV news, and I made it my mission to focus on positive news stories. And I landed a dream job with Five Hour Energy where I got to travel the country and do stories on amazing people who gave back but had their own life obstacle. And at the end of every video, I had this envelope. And inside was a check for $50,000. These were my moments on fire. I got to change lives. Oh, oh my. Oh. oh. I don't want to come to tears here, but it, thank you so much. It was so, so amazing. And they ended the program, and around the time they ended that program, my husband and I launched our company, Kombucha on Tap. And we went all in as, beverage, as owners of a business. And if you don't know what kombucha is, come find me after, because I will tell you all about it. But as, as business owners and going all in, this meant for the next couple years, I didn't do any positive stories. I was no longer celebrating people, and I was no longer in the spotlight myself. In fact, I was doing mostly tasks that I have zero experience in or zero passion in doing, such as chasing unpaid invoices and doing bookkeeping. And by year two, I burnt out. Now, I love our company. I love our team. But I was not doing what I was passionate about. I burnt out to the point where I wanted to quit our own company. And I would cry every single Monday for an entire year. This is no joke. Now, my lowest point was crying over these stupid blue plastic kegs. <laughs> we were supposed to collect 100 of them. And then the blue keg company would come pick them up and reuse them except that this company would never show up to pick up their kegs. So one evening, I'm waiting for their truck to arrive to pick up the kegs, and again, they never show up. And I just lose it. I am so frustrated, I just start crying. And I'm also really hungry, so I go drive up the street to get a giant burrito, and I'm stress eating it. <laughs> and I'm back at our warehouse eating this burrito, crying, as our young delivery driver comes back from his delivery route. So really quickly, I put myself together, put a fake smile on. I don't want him to know I'm crying. And I offer him half of my burrito. And I knew he was in a sobriety program, so I just asked him how it was going. And he said, every day that I wake up and I'm breathing, I'm happy. And I thought, wow, I'm sitting here crying over plastic kegs. What a first world problem. He wakes up and celebrates the fact that he's alive every day. Why am I letting a piece of plastic defeat me? Why am I not celebrating life? Why am I focusing on life's little stressors? Jared encouraged me, my husband, to go get a coach, to find my spark again. And to be completely honest, I think he was just really sick and tired of seeing me cry. <laughs> so I got a coach, and I told a coach about this idea I had to take a shelter dog out for the best day ever and to film it so that we could help get the dog adopted. I'd wanted to do this for an entire year, but I always had an excuse or a reason to put it off. The coach challenged me to do this within two weeks, and that is how I met Walter. Walter was a little shelter dog that had a terminal illness, and he was going to be euthanized. But the, shelter, the rescue organization that I volunteer with rescued him. And when I met Walter, he was really down. So I lined up a day of fun activities for him, including an aromatherapy massage. He got to go on a shopping spree, and he even got a little doggy kombucha. 
And here's a clip from his best day ever. I loved celebrating this little dog. And I am proud to say that one week after Walter's best day ever, his video went viral and he got flooded with adoption applications. And he now brings joy to an amazing family. What if we all decided to celebrate more? What if we decided to have more Walters in our life? Or to surround ourselves with more people that brought us joy and that we could bring joy to? What could become possible if we just celebrated more. You know when it's your birthday on Facebook and everyone pours love into you and it feels so good? Why don't we do that all the time? Why does it have to be a special occasion for us to do that? When you celebrate people and you celebrate yourself, it puts you in a state of gratitude and that has a ripple effect for your entire day. When you don't celebrate people, you want to know what happens? You end up focusing on the bad you create a negative space around you, and in my case, you end up in a catty newsroom celebrating the untimely death of your biggest fan. I think it's no coincidence that you're here today at Ignite. You could have not come, you could have left early, but something told you to be here. And it was a string of events that led me to meet David and then Nick and come to Ignite last December with Jared. On day two, Jared turned to me and he said, you're signing up for Coaching Academy, and I'm going to do Accelerate. And I told him, you're crazy, no way. <laughs> and it wasn't because I didn't want to be a coach. It was about the money. I was like, we're about to have a baby. We don't have the money for this. No. He was giving me the $10,000 check that I gave so many other people, but I refused to accept it. And it wasn't until the next morning that I had this emotional breakthrough, and I thought, he sees that I'm worthy of $10,000, but I don't see that I'm worthy of $10,000. And thanks to him celebrating us, we signed up, and it has been amazing ever since. Two weeks after Ignite, we had a little baby girl. She's in the back sleeping, and she's doing an amazing job sleeping. <laughs> and we get to celebrate her every single day. Also, since joining Life on Fire and being part of this amazing community, I'm now pursuing my lifelong dream to be a motivational speaker. Yeah. And I am back to doing inspirational stories again, which is huge. And I'm also coaching people, which means I get to celebrate people every single day. And that is amazing to do that. Now, when I'm on the coaching calls, Jen, Spicy Jen is my coach. And we get on the phone, and she says every time, what are we celebrating, my dear? And many times, my celebration is the simple fact that I am on that call. With an infant at home, it can be so hard to get it so that she's not fussing for that 30 minutes. And 90% of the time I do those calls, I'm actually sitting on an exercise ball with a baby in one hand and my phone in the other. And if I'm ambitious, I have earbuds in, and I have a laptop to take notes. The whole point is, you don't have to just celebrate these huge milestones in life. You can celebrate the tiny things. The fact that you are sitting in that seat right now is worth celebration because you care about bettering yourself, and that is worth celebration. So what if we all celebrated for just one day? What could become possible? What if you were a cheerleader for other people and you allowed others to be a cheerleader for you? What if you sent as many encouraging messages to people as possible? I guarantee it will change your life and you're going to change someone else's.